Billy's gone. I don't see or hear from him. Then I hear that he's in Mexico and Spain. He becomes front page an item. And then it made some of us want to know more about bullfighting besides what we see in the movies. And then by the time we all perhaps uh, were interested in wondering where he was, the story just ended. Nineteen sixty was to be the first year of serious effort to become a bullfighter. All the while, I wondered how I was going to leave without an emotional scene. Luck turned out in my favor when Mom planned a trip to the Far East. I left May twenty first, nineteen sixty, on the morning jet flight for New York. You have to understand now. You go around Madrid. Uh, Madrid's filled with with Chinese. There are hundreds of Chinese shops and hundreds of businesses. At that time, uh, there were so few Chinese in Madrid that when Bill would walk down the street, people would turn and look at him of simple curiosity. Pues hombre, el primer impacto que te da, no, pues es es decir, cómo es posible que que un chinito quiera ser torero, no? Porque claro, indudablemente en España se concibe el toreo. Pues eh, gente de Andalucía, gente de Extremadura, gente de, del sur, ¿no? Y que venga una persona de otro país con unos rasgos orientales es, pues, como bastante difícil de entenderlo y comprenderlo. Well, it was vibrant in the 50s and 60s. Actually, it was you might call euphemistically a golden era. There were a lot of great bullfighters, superstars, el cordobés and and the uh, senior Dominguin and uh, Manolete had left the scene with a bad goring and died, and Dominguin was the upstart. And it was under a dictatorship. Franco was an iron-fisted son of a bitch and knew everything about everybody. It was Big Brother time there. And the regime had a nationalist point of view. So about the only thing that Spanish people did in those days, that they were the only ones who did, was bullfighting and so that they could claim to be sort of special because they could fight bulls. So the idea of anybody who did not have Spanish blood, so it doesn't have to be Chinese, who was bullfighting, this could not be. He really had a great inside knowledge on bullfighting, not only from the uh, practical point of view, from the experience, but he also read a lot of books on bullfighting. You know, he, he was almost like Don Quixote. He read so many books on his subject, he was almost going crazy. That que me dijo, dice, fíjate cómo sería que yo en los inviernos me metía en el cine y veía hasta tres o cuatro veces la misma película en castellano para dominar la lengua, cosa que a lo mejor yo lo tengo que hacer en un cine inglés y no soy capaz de tirarme toda la tarde. Y ese sacrificio hacía él por conseguir que, eh, aprender la lengua española. Por eso digo que él era un hombre de mucha constancia en todo lo que se proponía y lo que, lo que deseaba. I was ready to give up on finding a room at a reasonable price. When, lo and behold, I found my room on Lava Pies. It was a small room, but the house was clean and the landlady seemed very nice. It turned out I was the first boarder in the house as she had just taken over the apartment. Luck certainly was with me, since I couldn't have made a better choice. The location was very central, and I could casually walk to La Casa de Campo to train. Yo cuando empecé a querer ser torero aquí en Madrid con 16 años, pues todo el mundo te preguntaba dónde vas a entrenar. Dice, pues vete a la Casa de Campo, que allí es donde se entrenan los toreros. Y entonces yo bajé a la Casa de Campo 
a entrenar media que ese torero. La Casa de Campo en Madrid es un gran parque donde en cualquier día, en cualquier momento, puedes encontrar 10, 15, 20, 30 bullfighters bullfighters entrenando. Uh, uh, it could be from the novice bullfighter who was out there for the first time, sort of in awe of whoever was out there looking, trying to learn something from them, let's, let's say, up to the figura del torero at that time, which it could have been uh, Camino, Diego Puerta, Antonio Ordonez, Antonio Bienvenida. Uh, sometimes these guys would come out to social, basically socialize. Other times they would come out to uh, again swing a cape. I went out there uh, to basically practice, uh, run horns, uh, jog, and uh, Bill would come out there and we'd do the same thing. We'd do it together. Y por aquellas circunstancias de la vida, pues aquí había una placita que es donde nos juntábamos y empezamos a entrenar. Y un día, un día aparece eh, una persona, un un chinito, un chiquito chinito que quería ser torero, que venía con sus tractos y que dijo que quería torear y que quería aprender también a torear y quería y ya ahí nosotros entablamos una amistad y una confianza. Éramos eh, muchos chicos, todos novilleros, eh, después unos pasaron, pasamos a, a matar de toros, otros se quedaron en, en el camino. Y así fue como lo conocí yo aquí al principio cuando vine. He was always good at analyzing things. Okay. And he knew that if you really wanted to train, you needed to be able to do a bull very well. So the first thing Bill set out to do was to do the best bull anybody had ever done. I think his model was the uh, dragons in Chinese New Year. <laughs> And so everybody wanted to train with him because he could do a bull so well. But of course, if he does a bull for you, you've got to do a bull for him. I immediately thought, this guy's really smart. What brought me satisfaction was the fact I was finally feeling good in front of the cows. I felt with only a couple more tientas, I would be all set. But alas, this was the only one in the whole winter. It began to rain and rain and rain. During the season, there was perfect weather when I didn't fight, and when I should have been training for the coming season, I couldn't because it would rain. It was beginning to appear like fate was working against me in everything. There's about 7,000 kids every year that try to break into bullfighting. Statistically, one or two only make it. And so you got 7,000 kids that try and don't make it. Bill knew everything about bullfighting. He knew how difficult it was. And in those days, it was even more difficult for him because he was too old to start out to be a bullfighter. Most kids are 15, 16 when they start. Bill was close to 30. In those days, Spaniards were very nationalistic and felt that uh, nobody could be a bullfighter unless it was in their blood. And Bill, of course, was Chinese. So every obstacle that could be stacked against him was stacked against him. Menos um, posibilidades, primero porque no había, en, hoy vivimos más holgadamente, hay más dinero, hay más posibilidades, hay más escuelas, hay más de todo. En aquella época no, en aquella época te tenías que ganar la novillada eh, con otra novillada, y tenías que ir a torear haciendo un sacrificio sobrehumano porque no tenías ni coche, ni medios, en fin, era bastante difícil. Pero también es verdad que se vivía con más intensidad. Back home in Berkeley, Bill's mother struggled to accept his decision to fight bulls. When Chek Wong was finally told of her son's unusual quest, she fell bedridden for days. She was utterly inconsolable. My mother had a different idea. It was not exactly what a Chinese young, dutiful son is supposed to do, is to give up everything and go to do something very uh, unusual like bullfighting. Well, I think at that time and place, you did more what your parents wanted you to do. 
And I think it would have been very rare for a Chinese American uh, to go out and try to be a bullfighter, a matador. So I think it took probably great courage for him to go ahead and do it, though he couldn't quite directly approach my mother. You know, she was always concerned about what others thought, especially the distant relatives. My parents were immigrants. I'm sure Bill's parents were from China. And so we had the motivation and we had certain social boundaries because the community was very small. Everybody knew whose son you were, whose daughter you were. And so you had to kind of behave yourself. And to have somebody like Bill pursue bullfighting was really quite outrageous. I mean, he either became a doctor, a lawyer, or whatever, engineer. But bullfighter? <laughs> In Madrid, Bill connected with the small, close-knit Chinese community. He often spent evenings at Chinese restaurants, drinking tea and talking about Chinese history. This sparked a renewed interest in learning to speak and write Chinese. Well, you know, when he was in Spain, he went to this Chinese restaurant, and they helped him learn about the grammar and pronunciation and all that. Then he wrote Mom. Well, she was real happy to receive it because her English wasn't that good. Currently, I am learning Chinese in Spain. There are lots of Chinese friends. Two of them own a Chinese restaurant. Every evening after dinner, I go to the restaurant. They serve me tea. Before I go to bed, I study Chinese for over an hour. Your letter is very difficult because there are some phrases that I do not understand. My friends help me with the translation. I have learned a lot and am improving. Mrs. Wong made it clear that she wanted Bill to return home. Your father and I were very hard to give you a good life. I hope that the first generation can do better. But you disappoint me. I do not know when my wishes would come true. You are over 30 and still do not have a wife. You travel far and wide and never think of home. I feel very sad and hurt the end. Well, I think everybody reacted the way I did. I'm the one who knows a lot about bullfighting, so I understood that he, he stood a good chance of being killed. The others tangentially know a little bit about bullfighting, maybe because we were close to Mexico living in Nogales, but I don't think they knew very much. They knew that there was some danger involved, but they didn't know how much danger. And I don't think I knew either until you get into bullfighting, then you begin to realize how dangerous it is. We all understood. We had a, even if we didn't speak about it, we knew what our challenges were and what we're up against and the sacrifices. We are in the oldest bullfight bar restaurant in Madrid, Antonio Sanchez, near Plaza Tirso de Molina. This was owned by an old famous bullfighter. Not only did uh, bullfighters hang out here, but some of the most famous writers in Spanish literature. Nothing has changed here in three centuries. All the decor is the same. This is really the holy grail of bullfighting in Madrid. Bill and I came here as uh, aficionados of bullfighting. So anybody interested in bullfighting wants to come by and see this place rich in, in history and tauromachia. Bill never drank here. I would come in, have a beer, a caña, a chato de vino. Bill would order a glass of water or a fruit juice at the most to Coca-Cola. He was always in training. As I understood it, it was very, very difficult to get a license. Fortunately for me, it was impossible for me to get a license. I tried. Bill had been in Mexico 
and David Moss, the other American, had also been in Mexico, and they had Mexican Union cards. Now, this is funny because Mexico and Spain did not have diplomatic relations because Spain only recognized the Republic and did not recognize Franco. They did not have diplomatic relations till Franco died. But of course, Spanish bullfighters were making a lot of money in Mexico. Bullfighting was the great national motif, and this was a nationalist regime. So it's not like they were encouraging people who were not Spanish to do this. But if you had a Mexican card, you, you had a right to, to, to a Spanish card. So I think that's how Bill was able to, to get the legal permission to actually do it. There's an activity that's called a tienta. A tienta is like a small fiesta that is given at the bull breeding ranches by the ranch owner for the amusement of a lot of his friends. Every aspiring bullfighter hopes to get invited, but there are so many aspiring bullfighters that it's almost impossible to get into a tienta. So what happens at, at a tienta is that the cows are tested. The bulls are the ones that you fight in the major bull rings. But in a tienta, the cows are tested because the female of the species is supposed to be what's passing on bravery to their heirs. They only fight two-year-old cows. And I don't know how many passes they allow them to do because they don't allow them to kill them. They don't allow them to be picked with a lance or any of the other things just to allow passes to be made with the cow. Bill went to all of them over and over again, begging, asking, pleading to be allowed to fight at a tienta. In 1962, seeds planted as Bill walked the countryside in search of tientas finally began to sprout. Domingo Ortega, a retired and highly regarded bullfighter, invited Bill to a tienta on his bull ranch. Well, it so happens that Bill found out later that his landlady at Lava Pies in Madrid apparently had been a richer family before the Spanish Civil War and knew Domingo Ortega, who had a ranch, a bull breeding ranch. So we don't know, Bill didn't know, whether she had continually talked to Domingo Ortega or whether the fact that he came to the ranch and continually pleaded for a chance to fight, suddenly he got a call and said, come to the Domingo Ortega ranch and you're invited to a tienta. All in all, counting aficionados, there were a good dozen bullfighters. Besides that, most everyone was dressed in traje corto, and I was dressed in a pair of Levi's and my windbreaker. Furthermore, there were only eight cows. My chances certainly didn't look too good. Domingo stopped the aficionado and stepped forward and said, looking for me, A ver el japonés. To say the least, I was surprised. I climbed down from the palco as fast as I could. All the while, I thought to myself, if you're ever going to be good, now is the time for it. Concentrate, and whatever you do, don't dance. Stay still. He let me give some ten passes before he asked for another aficionado. But in those passes, I was good. And he was so happy because he had had a chance to get in front of, of a cow to be tested. So then he came back to Madrid. And his friends were waiting for him. His friend says, you have to go down to where all the, the restaurants are, where the bullfighters hang around. Everybody's talking about you. And Bill said, everybody's talking about me? And so he put on a suit and, and went down there. This man approached him and he says, do you have a, a maestro, somebody to, to teach you? And his name was Blanquito, which means a little white guy. Blanco is just a nickname. And so Bill accepted him because he had been a part of a bullfighting quadrilla, those that helped the matador before the war. So he knew a lot of people in Spain. So Bill felt that associating himself with Blanquito was a break of his life. Well, Blanquito was everything in a way. Uh, Blanquito's credibility. Blanquito is like a famous restaurant critic, tells everybody your bistro is worthy of a Michelin star. Blanquito had discovered Curo Romero. Blanquito had been the right-hand man of Domingo Ortega and Pepe Luis Vázquez, two of the 
best bullfighters of the 20th century. His opinion was very respected. He was morbidly afraid of ridicule, and to have something like a Chinese bullfighter for him was a challenge、uh, because it's like having a Martian. And there's no there's no racism involved in this because there there were no Chinese taking people's jobs away from them or anything like this. This was just this strange person from outer space coming to Tibet and Spain and being a bullfighter. It's like, well, I don't know. I'm thinking of a of a of a black person singing in the Beijing Opera might cause a little bit, no matter how good their Mandarin is, and people might you know. And Blanquito was was what gave it. Absolute, total. This is a serious proposition. This is not a joke. This is the real thing, Blanquito. Hombre, por supuesto, mi tío cuando y mi padre cuando se fijaron en él es porque vieron sus cualidades para poderlas desarrollar. Porque luego ya se desarrollan mejor o peor, pero si no hay un inicio de cualidades es absurdo. ¿no? que un taurino de toda la vida se fije en una persona y en este caso todavía con la la sutileza de, de ser de un país que en teoría no, no han visto los toros nunca o sea, lo vieron en aquella época. Everybody thought he was he was really really good and、uh, Domingo Ortega said to、um, Blanqui, "This Blanqui, ¿por qué no le apoderas? Why don't you manage this guy? He's he's fantastic." Blanqui dice, "Sí, madam." Italian, yeah, and.、Uh, And did it. This was a very brave and committed thing of him to do. Blanquito had thought, as a gimmick, it would create more interest if I were willing to dress up in a Chinese costume. He brought out the subject with me, not knowing if I would be agreeable or not. I said, "Why not?" On the day of his first professional bullfight, Bill walked through town in traditional Chinese dress, greeting people as he passed by. The costume was a hit. People lined up at the box office, eager to see what Bill could do in the ring. Blanquito had chosen the smallest bull available for the fight. The bull weighed nearly 500 pounds. I was to kill the second of the three bulls. Being my first fight, I wanted to play everything safe. But with reporters in the stands and the possibility of coming out on TV, I decided to shoot the works with the cape and do my trademark move. My Veronica de Perfil was followed by a Chiquilina. The bull stopped charging, and before I knew what happened, I was underneath the bull. The bull had caught me and flipped me, ripping my talagia off my right leg. My suit of lights certainly didn't last too long in one piece. I was shaken up. The bull was strong. Everyone looked to see if the bull had gored me, but luck was with me. It was only a scratch without any importance. The banderillas were placed, and I dedicated my first bull to the public. Naturally, journalists and fans of Bill wanted to know why he, an American-born Chinese, chose to become a bullfighter. The likely answer is complex, rooted in a number of major events that occurred in Bill's youth, starting with his birth in the Mexican border town Nogales, Arizona. My father came to the United States, and he was in Los Angeles originally, and he was going to mechanic school. This is around 1920, so cars were new all across the United States. There were some Chinese in Nogales, Arizona, who wanted to go back. One man in particular who wanted to go back to China to get married. All Chinese had to work. So there were no extra people around to ask to take care of their grocery store. So they said, "There's a kid in Los Angeles is going to school. Maybe you can convince him to come and take over your store for a year." My father said, "I'm a student. What do I know about running a store?" And he put a guilt trip on my father by saying that if you don't do this, I will never get married. I will never have children. Nobody will ever come and pray at, at my grave, and so after a while, my father said yes. So he went down to Nogales. In the years time, he found out that、uh, it wasn't that hard, so he decided to stay in Nogales. The ability to stay in the United States had to do whether you were in commerce or not. So because my father created his own grocery store, he was in commerce, and so he was able to bring 
my mother over. Nobody else, no other Chinese women could come back unless they were wives or somebody who was in commerce. Bill's mother left Taishan, the family's village in the Guangdong province of China, to join her husband in Arizona. My father had several stores in Nogales before he ended up having the biggest store, which was not big by any standards today. It would be considered a mom and pop grocery store. But it was a grocery store that the ranchers came in to buy on weekends. My mother actually had a neighborhood candy store and you could make money just selling candy. This is during the Depression. Oh sure, there's princess every place, but I don't think we noticed it very much. Uh, during the 40s, uh, no apartment house was rented to Chinese. No hotel would rent to Chinese. And as a matter of fact, a petition was passed around to kick us out of the store. But there was another Chinese store uh, a couple blocks down, so the petition apparently didn't go very far. Every Saturday, we'd go down to the store to get our dime, 10 cents, so we could go to the afternoon movies at the movie house. I think maybe my biggest memory is on 4th of July. So whatever uh, firecrackers were not sold, my father gave it to us. And so we'd have a whole crate load of firecrackers and we'd shoot them all on the 4th of July. And uh, we had an uncle who helped us and uh, uh, we had uh, skyrockets that would go up in the air. And uh, we started a fire on the hillside because of those skyrockets. I remember that. Nogales, Arizona, and sister city Nogales, in the Mexican state of Sonora, shared a constant flow of people, food, languages, and ideas. The Wong children were immersed in the town's bicultural way of life. In 1937, my father decided that uh, we weren't Chinese because we were no longer speaking Chinese. Every time we went out and played with all the kids in the block, they didn't speak Chinese, so we didn't want to be different from them. So then after a while, we refused to speak Chinese. And my father and mother spanked us for a while, then they gave up. And so in 37, he said, we're going back to China to make Chinese out of you. So we sold everything, drove out. Uh, most of it was shipped back to San Francisco. And when we got to the Bay Area, the Japanese in July 7th of uh, 1937 had invaded China. And my father decided, well, maybe we better see how the war goes before we continue on. And so we stayed in the Bay Area and it didn't get any better. So then my father had two grocery stores in the Bay Area and he died in, in 43. I recall that I was in the car waiting for my mother and Lily. And I knew as they approached, I felt as if when they approached the car, that my father had died. But you know, when you're, I was six, so I, to understand the enormity of it, it's not possible. I actually was with him when he went to the doctors and he had a lot of pain in his stomach. And I, I remember it's etched in my mind, the doctor saying to my father, well, Mr. Wong, if you had come earlier, maybe we could have helped you. Chuck Wong was determined to keep the family grocery afloat and provide all of her children with a good education. And after spending all day at regular school, we'd walk two miles up to the church where the Chinese school was held. Uh, and then we'd walk home again afterwards. It was we usually Bill, you and I, I yeah. recall. And Rose used to walk with a binder on her head coming back home. And her, the whole ch thing was to see if she could go all the distance without making that binder fall. Yeah, I have a flat head, so <laughs> that was easy. <laughs> In Berkeley, the Chinese had their own group which were involved with the Chinese church. So we had parties all the time. We had maybe parties sometimes as much as uh, once a month, there were all kinds of parties and dances going on. So, uh, but we weren't invited to other parties, Caucasian parties or anything else like that. We were going to hotels out in high school. The girl wore a gown, and you know, if you were a big time guy, you'd, you'd buy her orchids. But we had a great time. We had the best time of all. I didn't think there was any 
something different because we stayed pretty much within the Chinese community. And as long as we were within the Chinese community, we were allowed to use our gifts, develop our leadership abilities or whatever. So it was not a problem. And all the family members would come home and work in the evenings at the store and on weekends. So there was a lot of family responsibility around running a grocery store that was open basically from 7 o'clock in the morning until about 11 o'clock at night. Each of us had a shift after we came home from school. We always had to eat fast to relieve the other person that was on duty. And if we had a conflict in our schedule, we'd always check to see who could take our shift. And Bill was always willing to do that. There was one time where I had a physics test the following day, so I asked Bill if he would work my shift, and he said yes, he would. And unfortunately, that day was the only time we had ever been robbed. And actually, he was robbed at gunpoint. <laughs> he was all white, like the color had left his face. And when the police asked him about it, you could see he was really shaken. So in hindsight, thinking about that, that time and the fact that he would then be willing to face bulls is mind-boggling. Bill was very serious. Uh, in fact, in my view, perhaps his seriousness and his duty to the family helped push him to Spain because he ended up running the entire grocery operation uh, while he was being an engineer for the state. And I think he was doing that also as a student, where he would go to the markets and buy vegetables and at 4 or 5 a.m. in the morning, come back and, and provide the fresh vegetables for the, the store. So he had a pretty serious responsibilities. The first time I remember Bill was when he was young, that they had a medical emergency and their doctor was there watching over him all night. And I think he was like two years old or something like that. When my mom was talking about Bill and he being sick, uh, she said that he had ballooned up. He was really huge and large, and uh, that, and he was still in his crib. And I think it was a condition similar to nephritis, though I'm not sure. At that point in time, I think Dad signed a release, as I recall, so that they could try a new drug on him. Bill recovered from this childhood illness and stood out as a high achiever throughout his school years. When he graduated ninth grade, Bill was elected student body president. So that when he went to high school, he was elected 10th grade president. And so he was on the board of what they call the board of control as the president of the 10th grade class. Well, you have three junior highs coming in together and he's the first Chinese, I think, that ever was given a position like a 10th grade class president. Well, you would get this regular childhood taunts, right? Ching, Chinaman, that kind of thing. As you're growing up, I remember when I was younger, probably in Columbus school, I got that. But also, actually growing up in Berkeley was very good because you, it allowed you to interact with other people. Also, when he was in high school, you know, he was elected into what you would call the elite circle by the whole class. And it included students of all races. So he probably never felt any kind of bias because he was accepted as a Chinese and an Asian at the high school level. Bill, probably of all the kids that grew up in Berkeley, had the most athletic ability. Uh, he was tall, he was fast, he was agile. He was very athletic. Across the street from us, there was a ping pong table we used to play, and I thought I was pretty good until I ran up against Billy, of course, and he just beat me handily. It didn't matter whether we played football, softball. He was adept at any sport that he really wanted to take up. We hit it off pretty well as friends because we had the common interest in basketball. And we played on the junior team the first year. But I always considered him a much better player than I was. And again, he, uh, he always made friends with everyone. He, and he was just a smooth, coordinated person. Bill was very disappointed when they said he couldn't make the varsity because he was too short. Bill was the tallest of all of my brothers, so I thought, he's too short? <laughs> Bill's too short? I think he was about 5'10". They said, well, he had to be at least six foot. 
we also had a Chinese basketball team, which was affiliated with a Chinese church called Berkeley Chinese Athletic Club. And there were uh, people from junior high school to college and the college guys helped the young guys. And we played in a church league and we played against uh, other Chinese like Fresno and Stockton and San Francisco. So we had different kinds of leagues that we played. Because he was so smart, he skipped a couple of grades. And so he graduated early. He, he was quite young when he graduated, even from the University of California. So he worked about almost five years. And usually by the time you've worked five years, you should be eligible to apply for your engineering license. And when he applied, they said he was not old enough yet. He had to be 25, even though he had the years of experience. Bill went to work for the state of California, which would be called Caltrans today, the engineering highway department. And he came up to me uh, oh, maybe four or five years after he'd been working for the state. He said, you know, I'm getting fed up with this. I'm going to do something else. I'm going to become a bullfighter. I've been involved with bullfighting for a long time, and I brought home a book in English about Juan Del Monte. It was about one of the greatest innovators in bullfighting, and that was during the 1920s, 30s. So he read the book, and I guess he got taken by the book, and he went down to Mexico City and saw bullfighting in the big arena in Mexico, and he said, I can do that. That's what got him excited about bullfighting. Everybody comes down here, and the police are at one end of the street, and they don't know where they're going to form the line, so everybody's moving around. And at 8 o'clock in the morning, the police blow the whistle, and the guy stands here, and everybody gets in line. And Bill and I were buying tickets to scalp. We didn't know oh. each other. And we, we, we fell into line together, and he bought his season ticket to scalp. I bought my season ticket to scalp. And here's where we met, right here, buying the, the bullfight tickets. This is May 64. 500 people rushed to get in line. Bill and I ended up about five hours away from the head of the line. But uh, when my wife brought me a sandwich a couple of hours later and we started speaking English, uh, Bill introduced himself. He said he was from California, I was from Iowa. He was a bullfighter, I was a Hemingway fan, a bull bum following the bulls. And from that day on, we, we saw each other almost every day for the next two years. We started having lunch together around the corner on Calle de la Cruz in the restaurant in Madrid. That's where all the poor bullfighters sort of hung out and had lunch. Well, we all agreed that we'd, we'd help support him. And we were sending, everybody was sending $20 a month to him. So we would ride him once a month. We never felt that he was taking advantage of us. Uh, it, Spain at that time was the cheapest country in Europe. So if you're buying a bull, this is a, a bread bull. A bull would cost about $200. That was a lot of money. The average peasant in Spain could live a whole year on $200, American dollars. Some people had sponsors. There was uh, financial support to maintain them there. Some of us had to be a little more creative and uh, find ways to sustain ourselves. He did what we all did as expatriates in those days trying to survive. Uh, we worked as extras in the movies. Uh, Hollywood is making a lot of, of spaghetti westerns and, a, and also some big films like Dr. Zhivago and The Hill. And so we usually got, act, not acting parts, but extra parts. And I know Bill worked as an extra in the movies. I worked as an extra. We both went to these extras for uh, the film Krakatoa, East of Java and spent three months playing rummy every day together <laughs> while, we, while we waited for whatever was going to happen. Of course, after three months, you saw yourself on film for about two seconds, if that long. <laughs> it was a means for, for Bill to earn some money too, so and we, it was fun. I mean, it was, you know, while he was doing things in between his training and 
between his bullfights. You know, I wasn't working, wasn't doing anything, and he said, let's just go. And, you know, they'd hire any of the Chinese that were there. And the only thing that I know that we put a stop to, they asked us to jump in the ocean, all the Chinese, and we said, no, we're not going to do that. So they, they, hired, they had to hire Spaniards to come in and jump in the ocean <laughs> because they, there's sharks over there. We're not going to jump in. Well, I think he was in a rental place that had no hot water or heating, and that's why when I came home for Christmas or I was gone for the weekend, I would let him say, come on over and warm up in my apartment. <laughs> Bill was a miser, and he, he didn't really spend money on anything. He was always very proud that he could get 21 cups of tea out of one tea bag. And that was the kind of person he was. Now, he walked to many of the ranches looking for tientas. And of course, when he did get a bullfight, well then, you know, the impresario would pay and his manager would take him in a car with the quadrillo. But, um, you know, Bill led a very monastic life in Spain. He, uh, he never took a taxi in Madrid, he never took the metro, he never took the bus. He walked every place in Madrid. When a friend asked him to look after his camera equipment, Bill became enamored with the art of photography. He took the camera everywhere, capturing images on walkabouts in Madrid and on his travels throughout Spain. Bill, ever pragmatic, soon found a way to profit from his new hobby. When I returned home at half past 10 at night on New Year's Day, I saw a bright light on the street. At first, I thought it was fireworks set by young people to celebrate the New Year. But as I got closer, I saw it was a car burning. I had brought my camera to take pictures of the night lights, so I took a few pictures. After the firemen came and put out the fire, I thought the photos might be worth something. I hurried home to develop them. I sold three photos to two newspapers. I used the money to buy a coat and three sweaters on sale. Bill had plenty of time to take pictures. Bullfights were few and far between. I knew several foreign bullfighters in Madrid, and that was usually uh, the bottom line for any foreigner. If you wanted to be a bullfighter, you had to pay for your bulls, and they could cost up to $500 for a bullfight. Bill's manager, Blanquito, by all accounts an incredibly proud man, was very selective about when, where, and under what terms Bill could fight. He was determined that Bill would not pay for bulls or give a percentage of his earnings back to the impresarios who organized bullfights, a common practice for new bullfighters at the time. Blanquito kept zigzagging. Finally, because he couldn't choose the bulls, he purposely fought with the impresario so he wouldn't have to keep on sending me to Albacete to fight. He also refused to let me fight in Pamplona because it was postponed from its projected date. I found myself not fighting because of the fear of my manager that a poor performance would do me more harm than good. He wanted me to be good, but without getting the experience I needed to improve. It certainly was not logical, but then it never is. I was to wait and fight in the Pueblos at the end of the season, so if I was bad, no one would know. It looked like a temporary setback with another long wait since these fights in the Pueblos didn't start until July or August. I went with him to several fights, but, you know, he was not, like, fighting 70 fights a year. You can count the fights, you know. Cartagena, Valencia, uh, San Sebastián de los Reyes, Vista Alegre. And by the time he got to Vista Alegre, he was really getting the hang of it. You need to be brought along. You need to, to, 
to fight lots of bulls and lots of cows in the country to get your technique together. Facing a dangerous beast in the ring wasn't the only difficult part of bullfighting. After a turbulent bout in Toledo, Bill was forced to leave without pay. In a mess, I entered the infirmary. They put a stitch on my eye and put my finger back in place. After dressing, we had to wait as usual to get paid, but now came the joker. The mayor haughtily threw 3,000 pesetas on the table as payment for my performance. Blanquito reminded him that the minimum by law was 5,000 pesetas, but would accept 4,000 pesetas, which would cover my expenses. The mayor said no, very definitely, and there things stood. My manager refused to touch it. The banderilleros went to talk to the mayor, but he wouldn't budge, and we left without receiving a penny. One of the problems Bill had when he was getting actual experience out in front of the animals was that he had been aesthetically influenced by Juan Belmonte, who was fighting bulls in the 1920s, where the whole, the whole way of standing was a bit different, and he had to he, he adjusted. He had a pure Belmonte with a cape, with a big cape from the very beginning. Bill's adjustments and where you, you could see his progression was with the muleta, with a small red cape. He, he was very uncompromising that, that, uh, about the art, that it should look like this, it should be like this. And so he started out very much with an aesthetic of a 1920s bullfighter, but after about four or five fights, he was well into the 20th century. Pues él era un torero eh, eh, muy peculiar, muy personal. Tenía su propio personalidad, su propio criterio de entender el toreo como él lo entendía, como él lo lo quería realizar. Eh, vamos a decir que no él no entendía de las escuelas. Entonces en España hay diversas escuelas. Está la sevillana, está la rondeña, está la castellana. Él no, él no se decía, yo prefiero eh, coger esta escuela o me gusta más este estilo. No, no, él se demostraba tal como era, como él lo sentía. Pero bueno, aquí con nosotros, que somos, vamos a decir, los toreos del centro, puesto que él estaba en Madrid, pues yo creo que eh, se ajustaba más al toreo, al toreo castellano. I had already written a guidebook to Madrid. It was quite successful, and I wanted to write a small guidebook on bullfighting. But I realized right away that Bill had a lot more knowledge about bullfighting than I had. Although I was the writer, he was the expert. And so I asked him if he wanted to write it, if he was capable of writing it. And he took it on, as he took on everything, as a very serious job. And, and Bill wrote a brilliant chapter on how to judge a bullfight. It was really classic, and I've never seen anything come as close to truly judging a bullfight as what he wrote. Bill came up with the idea of the four L's in Spanish. The four L's would be limpieza, clean. In other words, the bull never touches the, the cape or the muleta. The second L was lentitude, which means slow. You want that pass to be slow, but the bull never to touch it, but never to be rushing it, never to be very far away from his nose. The third one is longitude. That means the longer the pass, the better. Paco Camino seemed to have an arm that could stretch out forever. And those passes seemed to never end. And that's the one of the great qualities of a pass, how long you can make that one pass last. And then the last L was ligason, connecting your passes, having continuity, not just making one pass, but making four or five together, always keeping it clean, keeping it slow, keeping it long, and combining them. And this was the way that Bill judged bullfighting. Meanwhile, journalists continued to contact Bill, curious about the Chinese-American bullfighter. His news coverage spanned the globe from Spain to Malaysia to San Francisco. Bill's mother collected magazine covers and clippings and assumed her son had won fame and fortune. Why? You are all grown up 
and you have great success in your endeavors. You are smart. You should take good care of your body. Now you have fame and money. You are on top of the world. You have brought much glory to your ancestor and your parents. You also brought glory to the Chinese people. The Wong family is very proud of you. I will be comforted when you come home soon. Bill's next letter home to his mother explained the truth. After I read the newspaper, I understand that you think I have lots of money now. I have fame, but not much money, so I cannot come home for Christmas. Elder brother Bongit. And elder sisters Yim Yong and Yim Kwai, and younger sister Yim Lin, send all my money to me. Bill was also a success from the point of view of people who knew what they were looking at. Said, "Ah, this guy is the real thing." If he had come into Las Ventas and cut two ears off a novillo in Las Ventas,、eh, which he would have been perfectly capable of doing, that would have been a different story. The body is intelligent and has physical fear. I mean, I, I've been with Bill on the days before a fight, and、uh, the, all bullfighters suffer、uh, during the day. It's a high nerve situation, but he was as、uh, very, very calm. For Bill, his fight on July seventh, nineteen sixty-seven, at San Sebastian de los Reyes, was to be the pinnacle of his bullfighting career. The crowd was loud and passionate. The Chinese ambassador to Spain was watching from the stands. Bill was gored in the leg, but continued the fight. In finish, he would never get another chance in a large bull ring.
His team, of course, wanted to carry him into the infirmary under the stands, and he refused. He got back up, and he, although there was blood pouring down his leg, he fought and killed the bull and was uh, carried around the ring, or at least halfway around the ring, until his manager said, carry him into the hospital. Yo hasta me llegó a sorprender su facilidad de, de interpretar el toreo, puesto que era un hombre que no podía tener los mismos principios que nosotros, porque nosotros teníamos la posibilidad de torear eh, animales más pequeños y él, tu, él se tuvo que enfrentar directamente a novilladas grandes, picadas. No había toreado antes eh, novillos pequeños. Y claro, esa dificultad, pues a mí me sorprendió que sin torear eh, salía a la plaza y, y con las dificultades que entrañan los toros, el enfrentarse a, a toros mayores, pues... Es, te, te causa una impresión. I remember a, one of the most famous bullfighters of the time, El Viti, coming to visit him. This was like, uh, you know, you're, you're in the hospital and uh, uh, top movie star comes in, you know, wants to, wants to see you. Know. Uh, that was a big moment. Yo creo que la, la, fiesta, la fiesta nacional eh, para él era algo eh, grandioso. Eh, él adoraba, yo creo que un poco el, el, la bravura del toro. Él sentía mucho el, el, la, la, la vigosidad del toro, de esa cosa, pues él, lo, 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 eso sí lo impactaba mucho. Y, y después como torero, pues yo creo que también en la plaza reflejaba un poco ese sentir. Eh, no es lo mismo el concepto de un torero eh, nacional que un torero extranjero, pero vamos, eh, él, lo, él lo sentía eh, casi igual que, que, que cualquiera de nosotros. In July of 1967, Bill Wong appeared on the CBS television show What's My Line. The show featured a panel of celebrity judges who tried to guess a contestant's line of work by asking a series of 10 questions. Right, sir? Mr. Wong is a bullfighter. He's a noviero in Madrid, which is uh, the quintessence of excellence in the field. He has a nickname. Now, the great El Cordobé is retired this week. Yes. Hmm. And uh, we will hope that, uh, since this is the Korea that you chose, that El Chino, they call you. El Chino. Well, sometimes, yeah. not always. Well, but <laughs> they, they'll pick it up. The Madrid public uh, is strongly in favor of uh, our new Viero, which who one day will have to be a matador. And this is fantastic. Are you, you uh, very happy in the choice that you made? Or oh, you? yes, that's why I'm in it. Yeah. It's something I wanted to do. You want to do. It, How it's many terribly have dangerous. How killed by now, Mr. Wong? Very few. I've <laughs> killed roughly, let me see, around 20, I suppose. It takes extraordinary skill and courage, and I congratulate you on your courage and your skill. Nice to have you with us. After filming the show in New York, Bill began to think about his future in bullfighting. In the summer of 1967, he confessed to his mother that things had not panned out as he had hoped. I admit I have left home for too long. At first, I wanted to try for a few years. Now, more than 10 years after, I still have not completed my bullfight ambition. I need to determine whether to continue. Like you, I hope to succeed soon, but this is God's plan. These past 10 or more years, I have not accomplished much besides bullfighting. The most important thing is I have embraced Chinese culture. When I was in the States, I often tried to learn Chinese, but there were always other things that were more interesting at the time. Here, I succeeded to learn Chinese and embrace the Chinese culture. I will not lose this. In 1968, Bill's manager Blanquito fell ill and passed away. Without his respected advocate, it was difficult to find impresarios willing to book him for fights. Bill's bullfighting career in Spain came to an end. But instead of going home, he decided to return to Mexico for one last try at bullfighting. In December of 1968, Bill settled in Mexico City on a tourist card and began making the rounds. He visited bull ranches, looking for the right connection to help get him back into the ring. 
Bill stuck to a strict regimen of exercise, diet, and self-education. He read books on theosophy and meditation and physics. His siblings continued to send money. Six months later, in May of 1969, Bill finally decided to give up bullfighting for good. His tourist card was about to expire, and although he met with ranchers and impresarios, Bill had no prospects for a bullfight. Exasperated, he wrote to his sister Florence. Yesterday, the empresario of the big ring finally told me they weren't interested. Under the circumstances, it is useless to continue. My tourist card ends June 10th. I plan to sell as much of my equipment as possible in the time left to me and will leave on 6th or 7th by train for Nogales. I talked to someone this afternoon about another empresario, but it would take a miracle to change my plans. My great adventure is about to end. It's not as I had hoped, but there's not much I can do about it. Before Florence could reply, she received another letter from Bill. Although I didn't believe it would happen, it seems a miracle has come to pass. After writing of my intention of going home, I was interviewed on television. This afternoon, I'm going to fight on a nearby ranch, and now the second most powerful empresario in all of Mexico is interested in me and will give me a paper so I can fix my status in Mexico for another six months. After six months of drought, the life-giving rains have finally come. Naturally, I take everything as a sign to stay and have decided to do just that. Bill began to receive invitations to fight in Tientas and small ring bullfights. As in Spain, most of the bullfighters in Mexico paid to fight. As long as it didn't cost him anything, and even better if they offered pay, Bill would show up. Back home in Berkeley, Chek Wong gathered applications for medical school. Bill had expressed an interest in studying medicine once his bullfighting career was finally done. She looked forward to reuniting with her son, who she hadn't seen in over 10 years. Everybody respected him, everybody liked him. Uh, and that was very important to have him as a friend those years because it was somebody I could sort of imitate. It was a role model for me and uh, really, really important in my life for that reason. The stuff I learned uh, from Bill, just observing Bill, how he handled people, how he handled himself and all, was just precisely what I needed at that age to. Hay una cosa que me impactó de él es que lo, eh, Sinceramente, era una persona, él estaba muy preparado. Después, eh, la afición tan desmedida que tenía eh, por querer ser torero era otra cosa que él rayaba ya lo, lo, lo imposible. De todos los días, el sacrificio, que venir desde, desde su pensión aquí y para allá y entrenar y todo esto, pues esto también me causó una impresión. Pero vuelvo a repetir lo que me impresionó de él es la persona, la capacidad que tenía, lo inteligente que era y cómo él mm, afrontaba esa situación que no era nada fácil también para él. I would say, uh, uh, Billy, I think uh, your role in life here is to, to carry on the American dream for the rest of the Chinese that were, uh, or Asians that were living here in the United States. And uh, you, you've done a good job of, of, uh, of uh, advancing that, the idea that in America you can be what you can be. I want to hear the whole story. When did you leave? How did it come about? Tell me every detail. 
let me see the pictures. And I would congratulate him and say, I'm glad you did it. I'm glad you succeeded. You met the challenge. Good to you, Bill Wong. Oh boy. Well, I got, I got very emotional. I'm getting a little emotional right now. I, I wish the devil we had spent more time together and just talking and uh, what life is about and what our, uh, our, how our lives have gone on. I think Bill took a high road, a much more exciting one, and I took a more conservative one, but uh, we probably both ended up in the same place. And I'd give the world to, to talk to him at this time. Well, I would say to Bill that I was really proud I met him. I mean, I looked up to him, and I think he, he really broke out of the, the mold that parents expected of their children at the time, I admire that. Gosh, I wish I had, had joined you in Spain when you were going through all this. I wish I, would, I could have done that and shared that experience with you. And I'm happy that he really uh, did what he wanted to do. I think that was very, very important. I hope that all of us can do that. We just talk old times and and and, and talk, tell jokes. That's all. There's there's no deep philosophical stuff here, even though I'm Chinese. <laughs> Proud of you. Proud of what he's done or what he attempted to do. And I guess what I really would have wished for him uh, that he had come home to really to see my mom, because he had did have an opportunity when he was on What's My Line and he was in New York. We had driven up from Wilmington to see him, and we only had a very short time with him in our little valiant there, and he held the youngest two. And uh, we had asked him if he was gonna be able to go home, and he said no, he just was in for the show, and then he was going home. And of course, after he passed away, I guess that was the one regret that I had for my mother, is that she did not have the opportunity to be with him again. Hombre, me alegraría que, 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 que lo que le pudiera decir sería mucho, pero eh, sobre todo eh, me alegraría que hubiera seguido existiendo, que, que hubiera vivido. Eh, ya lo que le podría decir más o menos, yo creo que ese significado ya no tiene, no tiene importancia. Lo importante es que me hubiera gustado que hubiera seguido viviendo, aunque hubiera sido en México, aunque hubiera sido en Estados Unidos. We had a very close an interesting relationship without ever mentioning it to each other. Neither one of us was very sentimental. I came from the world of boxing, he came from the world of bullfighting. Our sentiments we kept to ourselves. We both like to consider ourselves professionals, but we had that feeling without having to say one word. I always say he's a Hemingway hero. And Bill was about being authentic, not about making it. Uh, who knows? There are a lot of good bullfighters that never get anywhere. Ver no bad bullfighters ever get anywhere. And some very fantastic bullfighters, through one thing or another, don't make it. So making it, is, if you knew Bill, making it wasn't what Bill was about. Being Bill Wong was what Bill Wong was about. Thank you.